Hi everyone, I'm Taylor Hudak with Activism Munich. I'm in London and we are nearing the end of this phase of Julian Assange's extradition hearings. This morning the court heard from two anonymous witnesses. Both witnesses were employees of UC Global. Now, if you remember, UC Global is the private Spanish security firm that was tasked with protecting the embassy, Julian Assange and other embassy employees. However, it was not long after that the company's CEO, David Morales, turned the security system into an illegal spying operation. The testimony is coming from the Spanish protected witness that basically are whistleblowers from UC Global Company in charge of the security of the Ecuadorian Embassy. They have uh, provided testimony about the atrocious spying going on in the last years in the Ecuadorian Embassy on behalf of the United States intelligence agencies. Witness one stated in court that David Morales insisted on traveling to Las Vegas to the Las Vegas Sands Expo by himself. It was at this time that he was contracted by this private company in order to spy on Julian Assange on behalf of the CIA. I am now joined by Italian journalist Stefania Marisi. Stefania works for the Italian publication Il Fatto, and she has also been a media partner of WikiLeaks since 2009. Stefania, I want to thank you for joining me. And just to begin, I want you to just provide me with what it was like to be in the embassy visiting Julian Assange, especially under the high level of surveillance. So, Taylor, thank you for this interview. First of all, let me tell you that I have been there in the embassy many, many times from the very beginning. And my first visit to Julian in the embassy was basically in November 2012. He had just got uh, asylum there. And at the beginning, it was um, quite uh, nice. I mean, it was... Uh, painful to realize that he was uh, confined in the embassy. You have to realize that basically I have been uh, working uh, as a media partner of Wikileaks since 2009. And uh, the last time I met Julian Assange as a free man was September 2010. And since then, I never met him again as a free man, always confined somewhere, initially under house arrest, then in the embassy, and now basically he's in prison. So uh, when I, I started visiting him at the embassy, it was painful to realize that he was basically confined in a small um, flat, and uh, with no fresh air, uh, not enough sunlight, uh, and uh, limited uh, human interaction. But at the same time, at the, at the beginning, it was quite fine. I mean, there was uh, an informal atmosphere. We could uh, discuss and talk quite uh, freely. But then, over the time, the situation changed, and uh, at the end, it was very painful. We realized it was like a prison, basically, and uh, we were under control. We perceived this uh, surveillance. Uh, though, uh, of course, we could not imagine things uh, as extreme as those emerged in the, basically, thanks to the protected witness from UC Global. We could never imagine that, for example, they uh, could plan things like uh, uh, putting uh, audio in the cameras so that uh, they could um, basically take all our conversation, all of our meetings. I know for sure they took even uh, the audio of my conversations with Julian. They unscrew my phone. They access all my devices. And uh, I was upset to realize that they were planning to poison Julian. They were planning to uh, let to leave the door open in order to make possible to kidnap or maybe kill him. It was really upsetting. So we could imagine, to some extent, this deep surveillance, especially when Moreno, Lenin Moreno, the Ecuadorian president who allowed Julian, who allowed the the um, uh, UK police uh, arresting Julian Assange and uh, finally put him in prison. We could imagine something very bad, but not to 
that extended that it, it has uh, emerged thanks to these protective witnesses during the uh, trial, basically. And uh, Taylor, let me tell you that it's uh, very positive that we have a rigorous uh, investigation in Spain, a criminal investigation by the, the Spanish High Court is very positive because otherwise they we, we, we would be dismissed as paranoid, uh, exaggerating. Finally, we have a criminal investigation. So this uh, judge, uh, at the Audiencia Nacional in Madrid is basically acquiring solid evidence of all these uh, appalling activities by UC Globals and uh, the Ecuadorian government allegedly in, uh, com in full in bed with the U.S. intelligence. So we heard from two anonymous witnesses who were employees or former employees of UC Global. What is your perspective and general impression of their testimony? I found it to be quite powerful to have this being spoken about in court. Absolutely. I was impressed because they provide many factual and precise information. They are not generic. They are not just hinting at some activity. They provide precise information, data and uh, uh, events and so on. So I think it's very, and of course they, they claim, at least if we, if we stick to their declarations, they claim to have evidence, they claim to have screenshots, they claim to have videos, they claim, and some of them, we have seen some of them. I saw my devices completely unscrew and access. I got an audio and video of my uh, conversation with Julian Assange. So I suppose there are many, many evidences. And, and once again, I'm very happy that we have this kind of solid evidence. And at the same time, we have a, a serious prosecutor in Spain, a judge investigating this with uh, solid, uh, you know, tools like uh, uh, the possibility of arresting him, uh, um, inspecting his house and uh, uh, intercepting people, questioning people and so on. So it's really important to have this solid evidence and this investigation in Spain. Now, we also heard from these witnesses that there was, in fact, a plot to assassinate Julian Assange. And this was on behalf of American intelligence. Can you speak on that and, and how you felt upon hearing this um, in the statement? Yeah, to be honest, I was upset. I was upset because um, we could imagine, as I said, that they were planning all sorts of uh, things uh, uh, to get Julian out of the embassy, to stop WikiLeaks publications. Uh, we we see how this war warfare intensified over the last uh, five, six, maybe five, four years. We realized that the things were getting worse and worse, but we could not imagine plans for assassination. Uh, we were very careful. I can tell you that uh, since he was spending all this time completely alone inside the embassy with good friends, fortunately, I believe that this helped him a lot because, uh, you know, he basically these good friends uh, kept his mind going and uh, he he had some kind of human interaction and so that was positive at the same time uh, we were trying to keep his mind working and we were bringing all the time new kind of things like a new kind of coffee uh, to to break this routine and the cat was breaking the routine and the journalists and the friends and so on uh, but uh, we never realized, we, I, I would have never expected plans for assassination from the uh, security company, which was supposed to, to protect him from intrusions, from uh, attacks and things like that. So I did not expect plans for assassinations. 
I I can tell you that we never we brought things uh, like food in the embassy. We were very, very careful, not because we were concerned about poisoning, but rather because we were concerned that even a, a kind of a health crisis could be a problem because it could it could have forced Julian out of the embassy and probably be arrested. So we never I brought uh, anything any kind of food from Italy, for example. I always kept this food uh, very careful, uh, never left unattended, never out of the fridge uh, for um, uh, to avoid any health problem. But uh, when I heard this plan for assassination, I was uh, really upset. That was something uh, completely new. I mean, I expected uh, uh, legal and extra legal problems. I, I I have been aware of the risk run by Julian Assange and by the weekly journalists from the very beginning, I could tell you, but I did not expect uh, plans of uh, for assassination by the very same company, security company inside the embassy. So it was really upsetting. Now, in addition to this plot, we did learn some more specific details about the measures that were taken uh, by UC Global on behalf of American intelligence to gather information on Julian Assange. Can you speak to any of the specifics that really shocked you as well? Well, of course, uh, again, I, I was shocked to see how far they went. They were uh, uh, basically collecting, uh, recording all our conversation. They were um, filming us. Uh, they put a uh, microphone in the toilets, uh, the women toilets. And I had understood that there was something wrong, but I could not expect, uh, basically, the, to have the microphones inside the uh, women toilets. And they were recording everything, even the diplomats, even the whatever. So, I mean, it's uh, appalling. And you can imagine that if uh, an authoritarian state had done the same, because we know that the authoritarian state do this kind of things all the time. Uh, but you know there is uh, political outrage and international newspapers report these kind of things. Whereas in the case of Julian Assange, uh, there is a deafening silence. I can tell you that we, uh, as a journalist uh, who was heavily targeted, I tried to contact colleagues who were targeted as well, like uh, Ellen Nakashima from the Washington Post, and basically, none of them is willing to file a criminal complaint with me. None of them is willing to, to join my criminal complaint. And I want to file a criminal complaint, absolutely, because I want to, I want that, to discover what they actually did, whether they access my data inside my electronic devices and the USB sticks. Uh, because uh, I know that uh, for sure that those data were encrypted. I have done all I could to protect my data, and there were important information. At the same time, want to discover whether they were able to decrypt it, to access it. So I will file a criminal complaint, and I'm I'm alone, you know, because these journalists don't join me. So I, I I'm completely alone, basically. I know that the German colleagues have filed a criminal complaint. And it's going ahead, it's positive, they are acquiring the information. So I'm happy that at least the German colleagues are doing this. And we, we absolutely need to discover what was going on, because, you know, it's, a, it's an appalling story. It's something you expect in uh, authoritarian society. And you, I would like to see public condemnation and outrage, which I cannot see at all, basically. If you feel comfortable, can you speak on some of the targeting that you have experienced? Uh, targeting? Yes. Well, uh, first of all, you have to realize when uh, I have been there many times, as I said, from the very beginning. And at the beginning, we had no concern. I mean, we could see the cameras, but um, there was a relaxed atmosphere. There was um, no concern, no, and Julian was, uh, I mean, he was confined. It was really sad to see how 
his health was collapsing due to this uh, uh, confinement, uh, lack of fresh air, proper medical treatment. So it was really, really sad for me because I could see his body ch and mind changing over the time. Uh, because I was there from the very beginning. So it was really sad, but at the same time, we perceive kind of relaxed and friendly atmosphere. But after, I would say, around 2007, all changed. And we, um, we never we accessed the embassy. It was like to go in a kind of, um, uh, in a kind of prison, in a kind of place, uh, a hostile place. And in 2007, immediate, a month after I discovered, thanks to my Freedom of Information Act litigation, I discovered that the um, important emails were destroyed, had been destroyed by the UK Crown Prosecution Service, which is the agency in charge of this extradition case to the extradition to the US. And it was the very same agency in charge of the Swedish case, Swedish uh, extradition case. So I had just discovered that they had destroyed crucial documents. And uh, it's a very suspicious thing because you are not supposed to destroy official documents about a criminal case, which is ongoing, high profile and very controversial. So a month after I discovered this, I visited Julian Assange in the embassy. It was the 29 and 30 December 2017. And uh, Julian was considering there were plans by Ecuador to provide him a diplomatic uh, uh, status so that he could leave the embassy and be appointed as a diplomat somewhere. So I went there. And uh, I immediately realized that there was something wrong because uh, we never had went to the embassy. Basically, uh, I was just asked to provide my mm, phones and my passport, and I was inspected for security reasons. But I was never ever asked to provide all my personal belongings, my backpack, whatever. Whereas at that time, I was asked to provide my backpack to the security guard. And I protested. I said, "No, I, I was never, I was never have asked to do so before. So why? Don't worry, don't worry. There is no problem. You, you live here. No one will touch your belongings. No worries." So I was concerned about my phones, as always, but there was no way to to ask someone to get my phones because you know it was end of December in the middle of a Christmas uh, holiday and uh, you know that we journalists are supposed to travel with our phones because we had to talk to the editors and so on. So uh, they got my backpack, they didn't allow me to bring anything in the, in the conference room, not even a pen, not even a pencil, nothing, not even my, um, my block notes. And uh, when I left, uh, so uh, I met Julian, we talked a lot. And when I left Julian, I realized immediately there was something wrong because the, um, uh, it seems to me that my phone had been screwed because I, I noticed something wrong with my dumb phone. Uh, I noticed something wrong with my encrypted phones. And uh, I immediately sent an email uh, to my editor saying, look, something wrong happened in the embassy. I was, uh, I was required to, um, uh, I was seized my backpack. I was not allowed to bring anything in my meeting room. So it was impossible to take notes, anything. And uh, I don't know, I experienced a disruption in my communications and, uh, and, so my editor said, OK, uh, let's see. Let's see what happens. Then uh, after I came back, I kept, I kept experiencing this disruption in my communication, which is still ongoing, unfortunately. And I discussed this many times with my editors. Look, my uh, emails disappear, sometimes disappear, and no one knows why. I don't get some uh, text messages. 
So it happened that uh, after my visit to the embassy, my editors were calling me over and over, and I didn't get any call. I didn't get any email. I didn't get any text messages. After two days, uh, that uh, this disruption happened since uh, since 2015, I think. For many years, I have been experiencing this disruption, and no technical person can understand why, basically. So I don't know if this has anything to do with this. I absolutely don't know. But I do know that I experienced this disruption in my communication. And when the UC Global case exploded, and when I saw my all my devices uh, uh, accessed by these guys, when I saw my phone unscrew, when I saw my meetings recorded, I was really, really upset. And I asked for support to my editors. I asked for support to the union of journalists in Italy. And uh, I absolutely want to file a criminal complaint and ask for support to the International Union of Journalists because I think you cannot tolerate things like this. I mean, they knew I was a journalist. I was uh, qualifying myself uh, as a journalist all the time. So they knew very well that I had uh, sensitive materials, uh, documents uh, from my sources, and so on. You know, you are a journalist, so you know that when you travel, you have to bring phones, you have to bring notes, and of course you protect your sources, you you encrypt everything, and I did. So I, from this point of view, I'm happy that I use encryption. At the same time, I don't know whether they were able to access the, the information I had. That's why, that's also one of the reasons why I want to go ahead with my criminal complaint, because I want to discover whether I have been able to protect my sources, because all my WikiLeaks work was uh, started uh, back in 2008 when one of my sources stopped talking to me. And it was at that point that I realized that I needed better source protection and I needed to use uh, encryption because I am a mathematician, so I understand the value of encryption in protecting sources. So all started at that time, and 11 years later, I want to discover whether I was uh, my my use of cryptography was uh, good enough to protect my sources, and I want that these people pay a price because this is. I mean, if you if you keep these people doing what they want, targeting journalists and their sources. This gives you a measure of what is allowed in our societies. And uh, I cannot uh, tolerate this. You know, I want that they pay a price, absolutely. Of course, it's completely unacceptable for this to be happening, especially in a democracy. Now, lastly, uh, you mentioned the Spanish case. Is there any update with that? Well, we are waiting. Um, as I said, I'm filing a criminal complaint, so I hope that once my criminal complaint has been filed, I, I have some better understanding of the case. I have access uh, to documents directly, and so I can have inside information about this case, uh, both as a witness of what happened, but... Uh, also as a victim, because unfortunately I was targeted. And if they did this with me as a journalist, I can imagine what they did with Julian Assange with his lawyers and with his uh, closest collaborators, with uh, uh, doctors. I can imagine how they targeted them. I can imagine very dirty things, you know? Absolutely. Is there anything else you would like to add uh, just generally about the extradition hearing so far? Well, I believe that this uh, case is the most important case in the last um, <laughs> 50 years since the Pentagon Papers. So I, I absolutely uh, think that uh, ma we must win this case. Uh, I say we because uh, I'm a journalist and uh, Julian Assange is a journalist, Wikileaks is a media organization. And uh, unless we win this case, the consequences will be gigantic because this case is about uh, the freedom of the press 
to be able to um, reveal secret information to expose war crimes, tortures, uh, extra extrajudicial killings by drones and so on. So we absolutely uh, must win this case because we must absolutely need a press able to expose this serious violation. Otherwise, we are, we are not a democracy. I mean, unless we are able to do these things, unless we are able to expose uh, serious criminality by our states, so we are, we are basically like in a situation like in a, an authoritarian society. Uh, in a democracy, it must be possible to do this kind of things. So we absolutely have to win this case. For Julian, as a human being, as a journalist, uh, for the WikiLeaks journalists and for the freedom of the press, absolutely. Very well said, Stefania Marisi. Thank you. Court will resume tomorrow morning, and we are in the final days of this extradition hearing, so make sure that you do subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can keep up to date on this case. I'm Taylor Hudak in London, and I'll see you in my next report.